uh, speaker, uh, Shay Strong. Dr. Shay Strong is the Vice President of Analytics at ISI. She holds a PhD in astronomy from UT Austin. Uh, previous to ISI, she was the Director of Data Science and Machine Learning at Eagle View, orchestrating a distributed international team of data science and en scientists, engineers, and software developers to scalably extract features from geospatial aerial, satellite, and drone imagery using deep learning computer vision. So really excited to have uh, to have you on, Shay. We'll take it from here. Thank you so much, Rob. It's great to, to be here and, and virtually you know, talk to all of you today. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to represent and, and to share some of the work that we're doing at ISI. Um, I've, I've recently joined ISI, I guess I'm coming up on my first year anniversary actually, um, but uh, you know, the focus at ISI is, is predominantly natural catastrophe development um, using SAR imagery, but uh, I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more in, in a moment. Um, my role at, at ISI is to build a multidisciplinary team that stretches from deep uh, synthetic aperture radar experts all the way over to machine learning engineers and, and data scientists um, who can largely help uh, with a lot of feature analysis and, and data extraction, of course. So just diving in with a, a couple more details. Um, if you're not familiar with ISI, that's totally okay. It's a Finnish-based company. Um, and it was the first company actually to miniaturize uh, small SAR satellites. So SAR, of course, synthetic aperture radar, I, I know many of you are, are experts, but um, just in case you're, you're not aware of, of it, but it's a microwave-based, uh, uh, microwave wavelength radar um, operating in the X-band, and which is about three-ish centimeters in wavelength. Uh, we have a single polarization. As of 2021, we had 14 satellites in the constellation. So earlier this year, um, we launched a total of, of 14. And you know, I mentioned that these are small sets; they are less than 100 kilograms, so they're incredibly agile. Um, you know, in terms of of being able to quickly uh, change the perspective of of where we're observing and where we're collecting data, they're very nimble. Um, but also, the advantage is that you know, because they are relatively small the cost to launch them is also relatively less. So there's an ability to, to create a constellation of persistent SAR satellites that can help uh, you know, monitor the earth for various change, um, both man-made and, and natural um, with little to no cost. And, and that I think opens up a lot of um, ability to explore uh, the solution space and, and really identify areas that, that this technology can be um, useful for. And, um, Another thing that we have, like like one of the advantages of SAR is that you know, fundamentally it's an active sensing uh, instrument. So uh, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't rely on the solar radiation of the earth to see things. And so we're not limited by day or night um, and nor are we limited by weather. So often you know, the X-band radars can penetrate through clouds and smoke. And so you can start to imagine the advantage to this, you know, for specifically for kind of natural catastrophe events that often involve weather or, or in the case of wildfires, haze or, or smoke and such. And the really cool thing about SAR is that um, like if you can get it, it get these systems in a coherent ground track repeat. So, so basically they're imaging the earth at the exact same orientation every single day. Um, you can do something that, that enables you to evaluate millimeter level uh, change in, in the earth's subsidence or, or just in general, like the addition or subtraction of, of things on the earth at that millimeter level. And that's fundamentally because not only do you have the intensity of the light, the amplitude of the light, but you also have the phase of the light. And so from day to day to day, you know, if you were imaging the same place on earth at the same time with nothing else changing, that phase return, the wavelength that's returned back, the pulse, would always be in phase with each other. And so as soon as something changes in elevation or um, or is removed entirely, then that phase will change. And, and of course, that's where the change detection part comes in. And then, you know, I'm really keen with my team to, to work on natural catastrophe applications. You know, of course, we think of natural catastrophes as like these adverse events on the earth that are very much driven by natural processes. But in the scale of our climate change uh, crisis, of course, these natural processes are, are absolutely exacerbated by human activity. 
And so in the background, what I have here is an image. This is actually a mosaic. It's a, it's a multi-stacked mosaic image from ISAI. The different colors represent different dates. So um, predominantly it's, it's red, uh, red uh, blue, yellow. And you know any combination of those then kind of represent the different changes. So if you see a distinct color like blue or red, that's information that only happened on a specific day. Um, if you see white, that's essentially like everything kind of summed together and there's no nothing of interest there. And this was actually a flood in Japan not uh, too long ago, maybe maybe about half a year ago or so. And one of the cool things to see, if you look down here, um, you know, see these blue flooded regions are, are regions that were very much inundated by some heavy typhoon related rains from, from this flood, from this, sorry, this uh, the river breaching um, into these agricultural fields and, and populated areas. And the cool thing is on this, on the red day, you can see regions of where the water actually flowed over and breached the banks of the river. And so we can start getting down to really understanding the cause and the time series domain of the activity that's happening. And we're not hampered by um, clouds or uh, uh, time of day. And then maybe more just on the um, kind of man-made side, this is a very similar example where again, the different colors represent different dates. And in this, uh, this is around Rotterdam region. So you can you know, definitely start to see some interesting port activity. You know, there's, there's various ships that come and go. So there's the ships that showed up on the yellow day versus the green day versus the blue day. There's a bunch of activity going on in terms of these shipping containers up here in the North. Um, and then down here, which is which is pretty cool, these are uh, oil oil wells here, where they have essentially these floating tops um, that prevent evaporation, and you can kind of see how the lids on these floating tops show up in different um, depths over the course of time, as through this observation, indicating usage of of this material. And so there's a lot of really interesting human activity aspects that you know, when coupled with um, interests in, in natural catastrophe or disaster risk management become really valuable pieces of information. So I already mentioned a bit of this and, and I, I suspect it's a probably a, a too primary for, for a lot of this audience, but, but fundamentally, you know, again, SAR is, is really lovely in the sense that it kind of liberates you from needing the sun to observe the earth, but it comes with it a whole bunch of other, other caveats where it's a challenge to interpret the tooling is some can be somewhat limiting at times and is often very locked into academic or, or governmental um, tooling and, and capabilities. But there's also this cool advantage, you know, with SAR in particular, where like at ISAI, how we're thinking about this problem in particular towards like how can we address um, or how can we respond to natural catastrophes in a way that is beneficial. Like we, we don't just want to gather data and sell pixels. We're really interesting, interested in identifying the solutions and the opportunities to help um, governments and, and agencies to respond to such um, disasters and, and, and evaluate the impact it has on the population. And I think there's essentially these, these three different parts. I mean, there's an economic part of a natural catastrophe where you know how fast can you get the information can you cover the, the region? I mean, today often what we see is we're working with insurance agencies um, or government agencies, like in the US, FEMA, for instance, um, you know, people are often deployed to an event on foot after an event. And so then there's a lot of um, kind of back projection of, of what exactly happened and where was the biggest impact. And so often that information, you know, just, just comes late or, or maybe is prone to uncertainty or bias. And then there's the societal impact um, in terms of, you know, one of the things that I love about geospatial analytics period is that fundamentally there's this um, very visceral, uh, tangible, quantifiable verifiability <laughs> in the sense of, you know, you can say something is true, you know, based on a location, you, you have a latitude, longitude of a point, you've said something about it, but in the end, somebody can go to that location and, and validate that point for themselves. So, so unlike building models or building analytical um, products in something like the financial sector, which is often, you know, maybe a bit black boxed to the majority of the world. There's a lot of opportunity to gain trust um, by providing information that is not, you know, being hidden or, or not um, inadvertently, you know, prone to bias or uncertainty. And then, of course, on the environmental side, like, you know, SAR is great because of the fact, like, no longer are we you know, limited by cloudy days, you know, we have the ability to, to penetrate through that atmosphere and, and at, um, you know, during the night, for instance, so we can be very responsive. And so when we come back to 
natural catastrophe, you know, we can, you know, we don't have to wait for the sun to come out to, to assess the impact of a situation. So there's a level of responsiveness. And then I think, you know, looking beyond, like, like beyond a specific natural catastrophe event, but looking at it as a culmination of those events, you know, we can start examining um, the specific details of, of what is that longer term impact and, um, you know, relative to, to climate change and how can we improve modeling and, and you know, just general responsivity associated with that. Um, so I just wanted to, to show with you some more dynamic pictures, which, you know, might be useful or might drive you crazy shortly <laughs> just with their repetitiveness. But, you know, there's this opportunity, of course, to differentiate and, and understand natural change versus the man-made forcing. And so kind of on the far side of the screen, we have the Fagradasviak volcano in Iceland that erupted earlier this year. And SAR was a beautiful example of being able to every single day at a very high resolution, evaluate what is going on in this environment. Um, and from a public safety and a public impact perspective, you know, where the lava flows are occurring um, or where some of these different volcanic um, uh, fissures were opening, is incredibly important for, you know, just from a, a public safety concern. And then in the middle, of course, I mentioned earlier the oil tanks um, and how, you know, you, in this animation, you can actually see the activity. So in terms of the, the human driven aspect of our changing environment and, and the repercussions thereof, um, you know, that is something that, that we can also closely monitor from this type of platform. And then another region where we're focused on on our analytics side is is very much assessing deforestation. So, um, in particular, looking at Amazonian deforestation, but also expanding out to Nordic regions and, and European regions. Um, you know, assessing. You know, there's kind of you know, of course sanctioned removal of trees, but then there's also unsanctioned and understanding the rate um, and having the resolution to uh, assess the, the the critical area of the deforested regions is is really imperative. And um, this latter component is one where we're very much focused and, and we've had a lot of success with leveraging deep learning uh, kind of recurrent neural network applications. So leveraging the time series domain of the SAR in conjunction with um, the deep stack of high resolution information. And another great example that, that is closely linked, of course, to climate change um, is glacier monitoring. So this was uh, another stack of, of imagery that we um, consolidated earlier this year over the Muldrow Glacier in Alaska. So this is a, a glacier that got a lot of news um, earlier in the year because of its extreme speed. So it's moving 100 times faster than your standard, your average glacier. And, um, you know, this is this is relatively rare. And I think from a geological perspective, um, there's a lot of uncertainty as to the driving mechanism there. Um, but then there is also the repercussions of what does this do to the environment? Are there people downstream that ultimately might be impacted by this? Um, and so there's a lot of both interesting geophysical, geological aspects of this. But then, you know, going back to how does this impact, um, you know, people that are living potentially close by? But you know these are great pretty pictures. <laughs> you know, the dynamic uh, time series domain is is a really cool feature of SAR. But fundamentally, these, these I've just shown you pixels. <laughs> great. So so of course, what can we do with that? And then the other question I think is not only so much what can we do with it, but like how easy is it to do something? And I think that's the tricky part with SAR. So you know all of these great features of SAR, the fact that we can kind of persistently uh, collect coherent information at, on a daily basis at very high resolution um, and look at millimeter level elevation changes. Like sounds really great, but then the real reality of it is that it's just a very heavy stack to process. So not only do we have the SAR processing and the SAR image reconstruction, because keep in mind, you know, SAR is, you know, it is radar. It's not an image per se. And so you actually have to take the radar and the interaction of the satellite as it's moving across the target and use that motion to reconstruct an image. So there's a lot of image reconstruction. And then you're left with this very um, heavy data set that has a tremendous dynamic range um, and you're trying to preserve both uh, the, the complex information um, and, and the, the amplitude information of the SAR signal. And then there's the added complication of co-registration. So, you know, even day in and day out, I mean, satellites, of course, um, can vary in terms of, of, you know, exactly where they are in their orbit. I mean, it's, it's small, but but these things aren't necessarily as maybe fixed as you would think they are. 
and and so even in terms of how you geolocate the information from the SAR um, sensor to the ground, of course, you know, can can dramatically vary from day to day. And so many algorithms, a lot of development that go into that. But it's again another heavy process where you're taking many pixels and you're trying to stack them in a very consistent way. Um, and then coherence, of course, like like I mentioned previously, that's essentially you know being able to maintain that phase information so that you can do that. Uh, differential um, uh, elevation kind of analysis. And, and like really a, a lot of our goal stems from, um, you know, applying machine learning and deep learning algorithms to some of these different data sets. And I think this is inherently like one of the biggest challenges with SAR is that it's, you know, not a new technology by any means. I mean, it has been around well into, you know, the early 1950s or so. Um, but I think the challenge is like it hasn't been open. I mean, there's, you know, I think there's still a developing community around creating um, accessible tools. And and I think if you look at kind of computer vision, um, machine learning applications and deep learning applications, like there's a lot of other um, proxy industries and, and, you know, people are more comfortable taking images, you know, red, green, blue than they are with taking radar images and doing something with it. So, um, you know, there's a challenge to both create new capabilities and also how do we even bootstrap some of these more traditional computer vision applications to these um, very heavy stacks with these dramatically large dynamic ranges and, and complex signals. And then every single SAR analysis is a three-dimensional problem. I mean it's not just latitude longitude you know to ultimately even get that pixel onto a point on the earth you have to convolve it with the the digital underlying digital terrain map. And that, of course, can come with a, a slew of uncertainty and, and a slew of needs, but, but it creates that additional complexity when we're dealing with this kind of imagery. Of course, you know, preserving the time domain is, is super valuable here as well. You know, there's a lot of information, especially in the natural catastrophe space that's happening um, pretty quickly. And being able to, you know, effectively use that and not throw that information away is, is one of the biggest challenges. And that kind of leads me to like, you know, where we are as a team. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of interesting discussions as to you know, kind of um, analytics ready data sets, ARDs. And I think where we're oscillating to as a team is more around like, how can we create analytics ready services? You know, with SAR being that there's, you know, kind of all these bullets that I've mentioned before, so many, um, you know, potential different requirements based on ultimately the, the what are, what are the, what is the question you're trying to answer? Are you interested in how a building is flooded at, in a plus or a plus or minus 10 centimeter differential? Or are you more interested in just like a, a broad um, town or the impact of you know, a much larger region? And based on what you're asking, that's really gonna drive the need for um, you to have a, a very specific type of, of digital terrain model um, and will also dictate the amount of co-registration, whether or not you're doing coherence analysis. So, so really to create services or to create solutions, you, you have to have kind of the efficient ability to create these analytics ready services. Um, but ultimately the goal through all of this, that was a, a long, <laughs> very maybe convoluted way of saying like, we just really wanna preserve the complex physics. We're trying to understand the domain and, and, and stay quantifiable, you know, preserve that ability for humans to agree with, or disagree with, with what we're saying um, and then you know leverage the tooling effectively to, to make that happen. This is an example of, of one of our core products. Uh, so we're very much within the natural catastrophe space other than kind of looking at some of those geological applications, we're looking at uh, flood um, monitoring. And so this is this kind of multidisciplinary solution where we kind of go you know, from one end, where the heck is it gonna flood? And so we have a whole process around targeting and identifying locations that are susceptible or, or likely to be flooded in the next day or so, or whatever the case is. And then the beauty of owning the constellation is that we can take that information and then task the constellation to collect information. And the hope is you get the flood peak um, so that you can really get the maximum depth in a specific region. And you know, I, I would be lying if I said it like we don't always get it right. Like, like it's definitely a, a challenge um, because again, you know, this is a time series event and often takes many different samples of that information. Um, but once we have collected the imagery, then we use kind of a combination of maybe more traditional geospatial techniques relative to the SAR imagery, also combined with machine learning from a segmentation approach to get both extent of the flood and then depth within that plus or minus 10 to 20 centimeter uncertainty. And that is like really critical 
at the building level. So you can see kind of in this image, this um, the blue color, of course, is a flood. This was for recently Hurricane Ida in the US. Um, in the north, kind of the, the aftermath when there was a, a tremendous amount of flooding up in the north, uh, northern east coast of the US. Um, but you can see the individual buildings here that are represented in terms of the impact of, of how, how much water they got. So kind of high, medium or low. And then the color, the blue color here is just the depth of that particular flooded region. And so our goal is to always get this information out in 24 hours to the party of interest. I mean, in this case, we worked close with first responders, um, but other times it's insurance as well. And, and having that fidelity and that responsivity is pretty critical. But we've had to create a lot of tools that, that um, you know, just simply because they're not, that not always um, immediately ready. And so kind of going more a little bit on this, this question of like, you know, th there's an obvious tooling uh, need in synthetic aperture radar imagery analysis. And I think there's this tremendous potential for, um, you know, what I would maybe um, controversial, controversially say, like we, there's an opportunity to decentralize a lot of information. You know, like I mentioned before, it's, you know, these are cheaper systems to launch than your, maybe your traditional optical um, uh, sensors. And, you know, you have just a lot more opportunity to capture information. So you're maybe, you know, you're not necessarily competing um, for the same kind of information that, that somebody with deeper pockets, you know, might have a, a priority over. And the other interesting thing is that my background was uh, in more in the optical domain originally. And, you know, previously working on kind of machine learning pipelines to extract uh, the, the kind of the conditions about structures and and what is going on in specific locations and we actually found like even though we were creating very um what we thought were unbiased models that are ingesting high resolution aerial or or satellite imagery you know we found that often you know our models would perform the best on uh over over data collects that happened in um very wealthy cities and and off and that seemed to be like largely driven by the fact that uh, the better resolution the better processed imagery sometimes gets paid for by those deeper pockets or more often gets paid for by those deeper pockets and so there was in, inadvertently like this socioeconomic bias in some of the modeling that we were seeing with optical imagery and you know definitely you know it's something that that can be counterbalanced with just a, a higher variability of, of better quality data but I think there is fundamentally maybe a limitation as to um, you know, where the, the highest quality information lives and largely again, driven by the cost of acquisition. And so you know, SAR is cheaper and then can be more democratically leveraged for collection, but that doesn't mean we're using it <laughs> as effectively as we could be using it. Um, we have started working with the uh, European Space Agency, FeeLab, um, to start open sourcing a lot of machine learning uh, capabilities for SAR, uh, and you know we've started on the very uh, like maybe naive side of of just like data handling and, and data cube creation, um, but then trying to take that all the way to like how do you integrate some of these heavy data cubes into a machine learning pipeline, leveraging PyTorch, for instance. And I did want to point out like there are a lot of great communities that are doing you know quite a bit of tooling between EO College, um, you know, a wealth of other GitHub repositories, but but still in general, like I think the tooling is still early. And I, I think there's um, a great opportunity to kind of unify a lot of capabilities and and just you know improve some of the accessibility so that we can start getting to um, the really interesting uh, solution development. And and you know, as part of that, like I had mentioned before, because SAR is so unique in terms of you know some of the parameters that that you're dealing with, you know, you have the time domain, you have you know a lot of material properties that are now accessible to you that weren't in the optical. Um, you know, you have really particular uh, components um, related to the acquisition geometry of these of these images, and you want to preserve also that that complex signal. So so all those things you know make make it a challenge, but that's also the, the really exciting part of where we are with, um, you know, building more SAR capabilities. Um, and just, you know, I wanted to, to show you a little bit. So ICE Cube is our ISI um, machine learning cube data structure that we're working with. We've been um, creating some, and it's all open source on GitHub. We've been creating some uh, notebooks on how to use that and, and we're open sourcing several ISI stacks um, to start playing with. And so this is the, the, the architecture that we use for, um, our flood analysis, and then also for some of the deforestation workflows that the team has been focused on. 
Um, and then just my last exercise, I wanted to share that like we do have our, um, we have 18,000 or plus <laughs> um, archives uh, that are public, publicly available um, just on the website. So that that's something that, you know, if you're interested in playing around with some of the ISI images for your own applications, you know, please, please have a look at that. And then um, we have been partnering with ESA to, as part of their third party mission, um, to make available for free for researchers, uh, you know, all modes of our imagery. So from the very high resolution, the 0.25 meters, all the way to 15 meter um, mode, uh, you know, and, and like it requires a proposal, but in general, you know, both new collections and archives are free. Um, so that's just another, another way to start getting your hands around some of this additional data sets. And I think that might be it. So thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and Rob, thanks for organizing such a, a great session. Oh, awesome. Thanks thanks so much, Shay. Uh, really, really great work. Been a fan of your work for a while. And it's just, uh, you didn't see me, but I was snapping through a lot of that. So uh, super <laughs> cool. Uh, I really like the point about uh, ARD versus like analysis ready services. You know, how are we, um, you can't necessarily build up static data sets for all the derived products. So what are the types of services uh, that can leverage the dynamic processing? Uh, I think that's a really important point. Um, uh, maybe that needs to be made at the, the ARD conference uh, next month. Um, so there's a number of questions. Uh, one uh, is, uh, what is the most surprising or unexpected use of ISI data by a user? Most, oh, well, we did get an interesting request. Um, if we could calibrate off of a sculpture in the middle of a town in Italy, like if we could use this sculpture as a retro reflector to calibrate the imagery against. And I, it was kind of this campaign around like both incorporating art and science. And wow. you know, we haven't done it yet, but that was kind of a, a weird, <laughs> but cool <laughs> opportunity for sure. Um, oh, that's so you know, yeah, yeah. I would say a lot of them are, are kind of. Um, I think the needs are common. You know that you know the quick response infrastructure, um, dams breaking, volcanoes erupting. Like the, you know, there's there's kind of a, a clutter of a very consistent requests in general, though. Totally. And uh, one interesting one that I don't understand too much, but yeah, I'm sure you will. Was uh, with 14 satellites so far. Is the phase return still on the horizon, or is that something which might be done soon for specific uses? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think you know we're still working on um, getting these coherent baselines. So, so this, there's this whole um, world of of SAR of um, you know trying to to not only put various satellites into a coherent re repeat ground track, but then keep them there. And um, you know we've been fundamentally like working on a lot of that, but in terms of, of the phase returns, uh, the team is is working on a lot of new capability there. So so hopefully that'll be something that that will be more broadly available soon, um, but still still a bit early early in the development. Awesome. And so, what's the weirdest radar artifact which you can describe? I mean, weirdest. I mean, I guess. I'm going to be truthful and tell you that I'm pretty new to radar, so I'm sure people have seen a lot weirder things than I have seen. But the, some of the things that I find particularly interesting that I've never thought about for from an optical perspective was, um, you know, how you get these uh, range anomalies, where essentially you get, you know, because you have this active system. I'm going to do a shitty job explaining this, but but you have this active system that's sending out a pulse of of um, you know electromagnetic you know X band uh, wavelength. Uh, to a site and then it's collecting it, you know, sometimes you get a pulse where, you know, you send out a, a pulse and then you collect it again when you're collecting over another region. So you essentially wind up with these weird echoes that get geolocated. So you'll have things like part of a city that's imid that suddenly appears in the middle of an ocean just because of the way that the information bounced back from the city to the satellite and the time it took for the satellite to collect it, the satellite was already collecting information over an ocean. And so you get a lot of these things and it opens up a whole world for some really interesting machine learning, um, you know, like correction as part of the processing steps. Whoa, so cool, so cool. Uh, what, is, what resolution and horizontal uh, vertical accuracy can you get with SAR? Uh, I mean, 
I think you can go, well, I don't know what the theoretical limits are. Mm -hmm. I know like our systems are um, 0.25 meters is, is the best um, resolution that we have at the moment. Um, you know, I think there's oddly a really interesting political dialogue here where I, I think there is limits that you can, you're, you know, that you're allowed to publish. So, so I think there, we probably have not actually explored the full resolution um, capability in that domain, but, but just from a, um, so like political aspect, there's kind of, you know, the enforced limits on resolution. So um, that didn't really answer your question, but that's where we are today. <laughs> I think it did. I think it did. Awesome. And uh, yeah, so the last point, there's a couple of folks uh, that would like to use ISI for disaster insurance claims and then uh, are interested in like pricing and all that information. So if you want to drop some contact information in the chat, I'm sure uh, they would love to follow up with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely share some contacts. Cool. Well, thank you again, Shay. Uh, really appreciate it. And um, yeah. yeah, have a great rest of your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.